Well here we are, we've just said goodbye to another month which can mean only one thing, which is that today I am wrapping up the month of March. So this month I finished 15 books which came to 5,513 pages, which gave me a daily average of about 178 pages. And I counted that for 30 days rather than 31 because I'm actually recording this on Saturday the 30th of March. I'm hoping to finish up a couple of more books this month, but I'll be pushing those into my wrap up for April. So in terms of how I read these books, I had two arcs this month. One was actually a physical copy that was sent to me by the author. I had two audio books, one of which was a reread, five eBooks, so books that I purchased um, online, and then six uh, via Kindle Unlimited. I had a pretty good reading month from a ratings perspective as well, and had four three and a half star reads six four stars, three four and a half stars and two five star reads. And then in terms of the genres, um, it was pretty standard. I had one contemporary, seven dark romances, one erotic romance, three mafia romances, one Omegaverse and two sports romances. So very much continuing with my dark and mafia romance theme. Now the first book that I read in the month of March was When She Unravels by Gabrielle Sands and this is a mafia romance. This one was actually on my um, TBR for March because I picked it as part of one of my prompt cards and the prompt on that card was read the first book in a series and this series from Gabrielle Sands which is the Fallen series has been on my um, TBR for a while um, and so I took the opportunity to um, slot this one in and I'm really glad I did. I really enjoyed this one and it was uh, one of the books that I rated four and a half stars. So like I said, this is a mafia romance, specifically it's an Italian mafia romance, but it also um, includes sort of like a hidden identity, a workplace romance and an age gap as well. And in this one, we're following Damiano and Valentina. Now, Valentina is kind of a mafia princess in uh, the New York um, Italian mafia and she is arranged in marriage to one of her father's sort of capos um, as a reward for um, this man in his organisation for his loyalty. The thing is, he wasn't a particularly nice guy. He's not a particularly nice guy at all. Um, and as soon as Valentina marries him, she um, is then finds herself in a very, very difficult and traumatic situation. And essentially, her husband is... is um, a sadist he takes pleasure in torturing people and he is also one of the mafia's sort of torturers resident torturers uh, resident enforcers um, but he forces his wife Valentina to get involved um, and take part in this and so she's like really struggling obviously um, and is kind of hiding quite a lot from her family she doesn't go out she avoids social um, interactions because obviously she doesn't want to tell anyone kind of what's happening um, and she's become very sort of depressed with the situation however she doesn't have sort of like the impetus or the courage if you like to do anything about this until um, a young woman is brought to their basement and um, Valentina is faced with torturing a young innocent woman and this is the final straw for her and she basically helps this young girl escape um, and she knows that she needs to flee as well and so um, she shoots her husband she leaves him um, for dead basically she doesn't know if he's dead or alive but she's pretty much left him for dead and she runs off and she makes her way on a plane um, first to um, Spain and then she gets on another plane and finds herself in Ibiza and this is where the kind of the book is set on the island of Ibiza. Now in the first couple of days she's very very uh, despite the fact that she comes from a mafia family and she is capable of doing some terrible things she's quite naive, naive when it comes to traveling and she finds herself just after a couple of days that someone has stolen her purse with the majority of her money um, and she's left in sort of dire straits financially and so she um, has to desperately find herself a job and she finds herself a job at this sort of like this nightclub and has to kind of like beg the owner to give her a job but also give her a job without any paperwork because obviously she doesn't have a visa or anything to be able to work there legally um, and um, this guy is very very sceptical Damiano in fact who is the owner of this club he's very very sceptical thinks she's just a rich girl you know um, just um, 
you know having a bit of fun trying to work and he decides he's going to make her um do a cleaning job and make her do some horrific sort of cleaning activities but she's so desperate for this job she um doesn't uh, complain she works really really hard and at the end of this first trial week that he's kind of given her he has to concede and say actually she's a really really hard worker she's surprised him by her tenacity and the fact that she's uh, continued to do this this horrible job um and he agrees to take her on full time despite knowing that Clearly she's keeping a secret um, because she doesn't have the relevant paperwork. Now she believes that he is just a nightclub owner, but of course this is a mafia romance. So it turns out that Damiano is in fact um, heir to a mafia sort of empire, but his uncle is currently the leader and in charge because he was the one that overthrew his father and, his take and has pretty much um, sent Damiano to Ibiza to look after the island so he is kind of the capo and kind of kind of runs the island of Ibiza um, but really it was a ruse by his uncle to get him out of the picture so that he couldn't plot then his own um, attempt at overthrowing his uncle which of course Damiano is in fact building up to try and do so he when he first meets Valentina he is very very intrigued very attracted to her and um, but it's very reluctant obviously to start a relationship with her because his focus absolutely has to be on um this mafia family and kind of taking control back from his uncle so it's a very very interesting dynamic between them obviously she's very very scared that her family is going to catch up to her and find her and um, and then obviously things come to a bit of a head when she figures out that Damiano is also in the mafia um, and when Damiano finds out who she is um, and kind of what she's what she's done and what she's running from but I absolutely love this one I thought it was really really well written really excited to read more in this series and would definitely highly recommend then I went on to read Gorgeous Monster by Charity Ferrell and this is another Italian mafia romance and it's book one in the Marchetti mafia series now this one was um on my TBR for March because I picked it out of a recommendation jar um, and it was recommended by Secura Blossom 94 so thank you very much for the recommendation I did enjoy this one I rated it three and a half stars it's slightly on the shorter side this one so it is um slightly less than 300 pages from memory and in this one we're following Natalia and Christian so this is an age gap romance a best friend's dad and also a marriage deal because Christian is the head of this Marchetti mafia family he is known to be very sort of like vicious cruel cold hearted as all mafia um bosses tend to be um and Natalia is Christian's daughter's best friend and Natalia has recently been dating this man from a rival mafia family um at first she was just dating him she thought that he was really really nice and then after several months have passed she starts to realize that he's not a great guy at all and she decides that she wants to leave him and kind of like end the relationship but this guy is not at all happy that she's tried to leave him because no one um you know leaves um the the heir to a mafia family and so he kind of puts out a bit of a hit on her um and um she is then in danger for her life so kind of in desperation she runs to christian who is her best friend's father and hopes um that he is gonna uh, save her so she kind of says to him you know like please can you give me a little bit of protection and ensure that my ex-boyfriend doesn't you know catch up to me doesn't do anything horrible to me now she's thinking that maybe Christian will do this because she's the you know his daughter's best friend but Christian has no intention at all of helping her because he's cold-hearted cruel he has no interest in the fact that you know it's his daughter's best friend couldn't care less um but he does see an opportunity that he can use Natalia to his own advantage and to somehow use her as bait uh, to bring down this other family and so he kind of um at first um, agrees that she can stay in the house as long as she shares information with him because obviously she has been in a situation where she could overhear conversations and stuff from this other family so at first he tries to convince her into um, sharing information and then um, when the situation changes um, and she's threatened again he decides that he uh, needs to marry her in order to keep her safe and so they then enter into this sort of marriage deal um, and yeah and their kind of relationship goes from there now like i said i did enjoy this one I rated it three and a half stars rounded up, 
rounded it up to four on Goodreads. Um, but I thought the book was quite quick. Um, Christian didn't really have a lot of time to change his sort of mind in terms of how he felt about her because he was absolutely adamant at first that he didn't care about her at all he was incapable of falling in love um, and then kind of the change kind of like and he and he's quite cruel up to a certain point and then the change happens quite quickly um, and I wasn't 100% um, I kind of didn't 100% buy into uh, the transition but overall um, a good start to a series and I will be um, intrigued to read more in that one when I get the chance. So then after that I listened to Fair Catch by Candy Steiner as an audiobook. This one is a sports romance and it's book one in the Red Zone Rivals. Now I picked this one up on Audible because um, Candy Steiner was doing all four books in her Red Zone Rivals as kind of like a box set and you could basically buy the whole box set with one credit. Um, I had previously read Blindside which I absolutely loved and so I had been meaning to go back to these and I thought it was a really good opportunity to go back and pick up these audiobooks. Now this audiobook was narrated by Hannah uh, Chiklana and Chris Williams um, and in this one we are following Zeke and Riley and like I said this is a sports romance specifically football and what I liked about this is both the hero and the heroine in the story are both in the football team. Now that this is set in college this couple are sort of friends to enemies to lovers um, they end up in close proximity together in fact they become roommates and although they're at college together now they've actually known each other since they were young kids because Riley has a twin brother and Zeke was her twin brother's best friend and they knew each other all you know like I say growing up they used to play together they used to practice football together um, and then when they got to high school a tragic um, accident occurred where Zeke was uh, driving a car he had some alcohol and he was driving Riley's brother home. Unfortunately, they were involved in an accident and Riley's brother ended up um, becoming paralysed as a result of this car accident. So since that day, Riley has absolutely hated Zeke with a passion. She can't stand him. She doesn't understand why her brother is still best friends with this person. She thinks he's selfish. Um, and you know cannot be trusted and doesn't want anything to do with him however they have continued to grow up together now Zeke and Riley's brother were in the football team they had hopes of going professional and Riley was also a very good football player but obviously she was a girl and so didn't have any plans to turn professional but when her um, brother becomes paralyzed um, he kind of gets her to make a promise that she is going to so that he can live vicariously through her that she will go um, she will play sort of like high, high school football and then go to college to play football and she uh, makes this promise to her brother that she'll she'll do it for him and so basically she trains super super hard and she becomes the kicker of this football team and so I really liked um, how this is sort of set up because as well not only is it about Zeke and Riley's relationship and how they're gonna um, you know they re repair the relationship they've got together and move forward and actually turn it into an actual romantic relationship um, but also it explores how difficult it is for Riley to kind of um, be part of this very masculine football team and earn the respect and trust of the rest of the team so I really kind of like that element to it as well um, of course we learn that there's more to the story about the accident, that maybe everything wasn't quite Zeke's fault. Um, but essentially what happens is, because Zeke and Riley are on the same college football team and no one else wants to room with a girl, but she wants to stay in the same kind of like dorm as you like as the rest of the football players, Zeke is the only one that will agree to basically being her roommate. And so even though they kind of, even though Riley doesn't really like Zeke, um, Zeke absolutely still cares very much for her, also wants to look after her, you know, because it's his best friend's sister, uh, keeps an eye on her, looks after her, makes sure she's being treated well in the football team, but also volunteers to kind of be her roommate and therefore they then become in close proximity with each other and they start to kind of get to know each other a little bit more and like I say, secrets are going to be revealed about this accident, maybe that it wasn't all Zeke's fault um, and, you know, their relationship kind of goes from there. So I really like this one overall and rated it four stars. Then the next one that I read was Hills 
of Shivers and Shadow by Pam Godwin and I have it here it's a very very hefty book I was fortunate enough to get this one as an arc and I also uh, vlogged about this one so I have a complete video which documents my time reading this one so I'm not going to go into this one to, in too much detail but this is a dark romance it's book one in a trilogy um, the Frozen Fate trilogy that follows these characters um, it's very much a like I say a dark romance and it's about this uh, woman called Frankie who is abducted by uh, Denver and taken to a very remote location in Alaska where the obviously the environment is very very harsh and unforgiving and she finds herself trapped there not only with Denver but with his three sons Leonid, Wolfson and Kodiak. Now this is very very dark, very very atmospheric, very very suspenseful and um, there's loads of different tropes in this one and loads of trigger warnings so I would highly recommend that you check those out. Um, however it was absolutely brilliantly written um, fantastic read rated it five stars cannot wait until the next book comes out which is a um a cage of ice and echoes i believe that is what it's called and i'm hoping to get an arc of that one as well and i will most likely um, vlog that as well as i'm reading it because these are you know pretty hefty books um and that absolutely deserve that level of focus um, so yeah if you want to know more about what happens in this one and my thoughts please check out that vlog and like I say would highly recommend five star read. After that then I moved on to Unfurl by Elodie Hart and this was another pick for my TBR from Ajar and this was um, recommended by um, a booktuber oh hey it's McKay as one of her favourite books of 2023. Now this is a an erotic romance. It focuses on sort of sex education. We have a virgin heroine. There's an age gap between this couple. Um, some role play, and it kind of uh, is set in a sex club. Um, it's book one in the Alchemy series, and Alchemy is the name of this sort of sex club, and it's owned part owned by Rafe, who is our hero. Um, and then we're also following Belle in this one as well. So overall, I rated this one three and a half stars, and read it on Kindle Unlimited. Belle is, like I say, she's our virgin heroine. She is in her early 20s, but she comes from a very, very religious family and has been, uh, you know, has, has uh, been educated in a Catholic school and holds a lot of guilt about um, her sexuality and um, thoughts about um, sex in general and Rafe our hero he was brought up in a similar environment but he's kind of broken away from that mold and with two friends has set up this sort of like this sex club and one of the things uh, that his sex club is most well known for that he takes the most pride in is this unfurl program that they have which is basically helping uh, virgins to um, explore their sexuality um, be comfortable in an environment um, where they are learning about about sex and what they like and they um, do tailored programs um, for the people that want to go through it um, and to kind of play out their fantasy. This couple first meet because Belle's parents are going away for the summer for several months, they're going to be touring Europe and um, Belle is going to be moving back into their apartment to um, look after the apartment and sort of stay there while they're away. And one of their neighbours is actually Rafe. And so before they go on holiday, they kind of have a bit of a dinner party with their neighbours so Belle can get to know the neighbours while they're away. And that is where she first meets Rafe. Now, immediately they're both attracted to each other. Um, and But Belle is obviously very aware that Rafe is a little bit older than her. Um, and then she discovers through a friend that he owns a sex club and she learns about this unfurl program and she's very very curious so she decides that she's going to fill in the paperwork, answer the questionnaire and see if she can get herself onto the program. Of course when Rafe realises that Belle has applied for the program he is not going to let anyone else um, help her through her unfurling um, and decides that he is going to step up to the plate and kind of um, you know be her mentor um, as she goes through the program um, and of course like I say this this couple have a great amount of chemistry and so they get to explore their fantasies together as we go through the book so this is really like I say quite an erotic romance now I did enjoy this one however I found myself getting a little bit bored if I'm honest um, just as we went through it became a little bit 
samey samey for me personally um, and therefore I didn't absolutely love this one which is why I rated it three and a half stars and rounded it up to four stars on Goodreads. So then after that I read Brutal Prince by Sophie Lark. This was another book that was on my TBR for March and this was um, picked with a prompt card which was um, picking an author with the surname beginning with L. So I picked a Sophie Lark book. Now again Brutal Prince has been on my TBR for a long time. It is book one in the Brutal Birthright series um, and again this one is a mafia romance but it's also enemies to lovers and also an arranged marriage as well. Um, really really enjoyed this one rated it four and a half stars and read it on kindle unlimited now we're following callum and ada now this is kind of an italian and irish mafia pairing and callum and aiden's family don't get on but they're not necessarily at war with each other however they do need to form an alliance because there's some other uh, you know families in the area that is causing them some problems however no discussions have been had at this stage about merging these families together in fact they're they're pretty happy to stay uh, separate until one night um ada um commits her brothers basically to um gate crash um a party at callum's family's sort of mansion um and while she's there she uh accidentally sets fire to their library Callum obviously catches her in the act and then chases her out of the house and she kind of runs off. Not only that, but she's stolen his uh, granddad's pocket watch. And so he goes after her in a bit of a rage. And when he catches up to her and her brother, um, there is a bit of a fight. Her brother gets quite seriously injured um, and she, in a rage, she throws the pocket watch into the sea. So Callum and Ada get off on a really, really bad foot here. However, when the fathers find out what's gone on, they decide that the best way to prevent a war from happening, from this, from any further incidents taking place or this, this incident escalating further, is to force um, Callum and Ada into a marriage um, and so Ada finds herself having to marry Callum but she's heard that he is allergic to strawberries so is a bit of revenge and to uh, ruin the um, the wedding reception she eats loads and loads of strawberries before she gets married so that when he has to kiss the bride he ends up kissing her um, and then has this severe anaphylactic shock because of the strawberries that are on her lips um, and so um, then Callum has to be whisked off to hospital on uh, the afternoon of his wedding day. And this is basically really sets the tone for this couple's relationship with each other. They're constantly at each other's throats, trying to find a way to kind of like one up each other. And I really, really did like this dynamic in this relationship. Um, on one hand, you could say it was a little bit childish, but also it was great fun to read. I really, really enjoyed this couple. And of course, before they fall in love with each other they also have hate sex as well which is um also fun to read about um and so yeah like i said i really enjoyed this one four and a half stars and we'll definitely be going on to read the other books in the series so then after that i read not a trace by lillian carlisle and this is part one of a duet so it's not a trace um, duet so I was hoping that part two would come out this month but it didn't she pushed it back until April but nevertheless I forged forward and read part one of this duet it's an Omega verse why choose story um so it does feature fated mates I really enjoy Lillian Carlyle's writing and I think she does some really good Omega verse if you like that type of romance and so I rated this one four stars and I read it on Kindle Unlimited. Now in this one we're following Skylar and she has a best friend called April. They own a bakery together. Um, and uh, Skylar is an Omega but she hasn't been, she hasn't dated anyone or been with anyone for about 18 months because her last boyfriend um, didn't treat her very well and has, um, you know, really, really knocked her confidence and so she mainly focuses on this bakery and creating, um, in particular, they bake a lot of macaroons. So they're, they're famous for their macaroons in this shop. Now, one night, April leaves the shop. Um, she goes home. But the next morning, she doesn't come back to work. And um, um, Skylar gets very, very concerned about her friend. This is very, very unlike her. It's not normal. So she goes around to her house and the house 
um, is empty but her car is gone but her purse is still on the sort of like the coffee table um, and so Scarlett realises something terrible has happened to her friend she rings the police the police at first don't do anything because they're like well she hasn't even gone 24 hours we don't she could have gone somewhere I'm sure she'll turn up it's not really a missing person but as more time goes by it becomes more and more obvious that April has definitely been taken something has happened to her um, and um, Skylar becomes obsessed with trying to find her friend um, and also uses the bakery to raise money so that she can go out on and you know she can organize sort of like um, advertisements around the country put up posters and get groups of people together to you know um, search the area to see if they can find any trace of her now several weeks go by and they still have had no trace of April and eventually Scarlett hears about um, this um, alpha um, sort of detective agency um, that London and River work at. So London and River are two of our heroes um, and they work at this place. So Scarlett goes to see them and begs them to help her find April. Now it's not really the sort of case they take because they do a lot of work for the government and things and they're not really into, mis you know, trying to find missing, um, missing um, Omegas. But London uh, and River do take an instant like to Skylar because um, obviously they're going to end up being fated mates and so they can't really stay away and so they're sort of like well we can't really take your case but we don't want to turn you away completely and we'll sort of help you and so London and River kind of start this relationship with Skylar getting close to her try, like really kind of like trying to fight their attraction to her also London and River although they work together they don't really get on and so there's a bit of animosity between them at first they're not really too sure if they want to share Skylar or if they're going to fight to have her independently um, but in this sort of Omegaverse world um, the Omegas usually do have like you know packs so multiple alphas that are with them so London and River come to like this sort of agreement that they will um, share Skylar. Now we have an, a, an additional person, Vincent, who will also eventually be part of this relationship with them. But Vincent is a bit of an outsider. So London and River used to work with Vincent, and we know two years ago something happened, and Vincent now doesn't work with them anymore, and he's pretty much lived as a recluse for the last two years. But they know he's the best person at finding missing people, and so they go to Vincent and say, Hey, We've got this Omega that we really, really like, Skylar. We want to help her, but we can't help her properly because we've got all this other work we need to do and we want you uh, to help us. And at first, Vincent is adamant he's not going to help them because of the whatever's happened in the past, he's no longer speaking to Landon and River. But he's also intrigued and agrees to meet Skylar. And of course, when he meets Skylar, he's going to um, catch feelings as well. Now, this one does end on a bit of a cling cliffhanger. So by the end of this book, we have Landon, River and Vincent, who are all going to be Skylar's alphas in the end. Um, and they are kind of trying to figure out how they're all going to work together because they don't like each other, how they're going to share Skylar um, and try and start helping her find April. And then, and then, of course, this ends on a quite a big cliffhanger where Skylar, Skylar herself is now taken captive and she disappears so these three alphas are going to have to work together to not only find April but to find Skylar um, and so I really enjoyed this one and can't wait to part two and to see how this one is going to resolve itself. Then I read Malevolent by uh, Lainey De La Roque. Um, this is an ARC copy that I got from the author directly. It's my very first ever uh, sort of PR box that I've received from an author so I was really excited to pick this one up and read this one. This actually is coming out today on the day that I record this because the release date for this one was the 30th of March so if you are interested in this one it's now available for you to purchase. Now this one is book one in the Deviants of Onyx Grove series and I believe it's going to be a trilogy um, and therefore it's following the same group of people. So this is a dark, why choose romance? Um, and this is also kind of in, uh, uh, in the beginning, it's very much a mystery. We don't really know what's going on. Um, but you could loosely say it's also a workplace romance, um, certainly hidden identity. And the this group of people that we'll be following uh, that are gonna be in a relationship together um, is Jade, Hunter, Alex, 
and Leo. But again, this is part of a trilogy. So what I will say is this one doesn't obviously end. There's more to this of the story to come. And also there is not a lot of romance in this particular book. Like we don't have any kind of resolutions to any of these relationships. So what we know in this one is that Jade is our heroine and she has been away from Onyx Grove. It's the place where this book is set for many years. But something happened in Onyx Grove and she is now back um, to get revenge. And she very much believes that she's getting revenge on these three male characters in this book, Hunter, Alex and Leo. So this book, like I say, is very much set up as a mystery because we really don't know what's going on when this starts. And I feel like we still don't really know what's going on by the time this book ends either. We're left with more questions than answers, I would definitely say. And as a result of that, at times while I was reading this book, I found myself to be quite confused Certainly for the first sort of like 30% of this book, I was just confused about what was going on. Now, as we sort of like get deeper into the book, you can start making sort of connections and conclusions about what you're reading. Um, some of the things we've seen start to make a bit more sense. But like I said, there are still lots of questions left unanswered by the time we get to end of this particular one. And also, like I mentioned, although this is supposed to be a white choose, Jade has had some sexual interactions with both... Um, Hunter, Alex and Leo, sometimes separately and a couple of times uh, with Alex and Leo together. But still, it didn't particularly feel romantic. Um, and this is very much still the start of their relationship because we're still trying to figure out who each person is, what their place in this storyline is and how they all interact with each other. So I rated this one three and a half stars. I've rounded it up to four on Goodreads um, and I did... Uh, find this very intriguing. I will definitely go on to read more books in this series and I may lift the rating on this book when I've read more um, but like I say this is this is sort of leans more towards a mystery for me um, and I spent the majority of the time reading this a little bit confused and trying to kind of figure out what was going on. Now I'm sure all will be revealed in the upcoming books. I think this relationship between these uh, individuals will absolutely develop um, and it will become a fully fledged what I choose um, but in the minute because it's only book one of their story we're still very much left um, not knowing um, quite a lot of things. So after that I finished Blindside by Candy Steiner. This was book two in the Red Zone Rivals so I listened to this one as an audiobook. It was narrated by Edward Black and Miranda Dyer. This was a reread for me, like I said I'd read it before and rated this one five stars. I really really enjoyed it and um, not only was this a um, sports romance, a football romance, but also this has had one of my favourite tropes in it, which is fake dating. There's also a little bit of sex education going on in here because the heroine um, is a virgin and she asks the hero for sort of guidance and help. So in this one, we're following Clay and Gianna, and Clay is one of the stars of the football team. Um, and Gianna is kind of like the media assist. So she's still in college, um, but she's kind of like a media um, major. And part, one of her jobs is that she basically um, does P PR media for the football team. At the start of this block, Clay is dumped by his long-term girlfriend. Um, and he's absolutely devastated. He had this girlfriend in high school. He thought she was the one. He really thought they were going to get married. Um, and she has recently split with him and now he is absolutely devastated and he's very, very gloomy. And where before he was a very reliable member of the team, would always be really, really good in media, interviews with the newspapers, journalists and that sort of thing. He is now uh, not doing so great. And so Gianna is absolutely mortified um, that he's been rude to a journalist and her boss basically says you need to get Clay in order. So Gianna sort of takes Clay to one side and says, look, I know you've just split up with your girlfriend, but it's not acceptable, but I'll do you a deal. You, um, I won't put you in front of any more um, uh, journalists or any more media people. I'll give you a couple of weeks to get yourself sorted out. Um, but then you are going to give the interview of your life and um, you're going to do it for me because I, you know, my boss is counting on me to make this work. And Clay has also been observing Gianna and he's worked out that she is uh, attracted to this um, musician who plays in a 
in a cafe around campus um but she is too afraid to go up to him or say anything to him so clay says okay i'll do you a deal um not only will i do a really good interview in a couple of weeks if you leave me alone until then but i could really use your help in getting uh, my ex-girlfriend to uh, take me back and i think if we fake date she's going to be really really jealous realize what she's missed and then want to get uh, get back together with me and i can increase your street cred um get the musician guy to notice you and then we can you know we can both get what we want gianna agrees to this and therefore they start fake dating but of course in any um fake dating trope what actually happens is the more time they spend together the more they really really like each other um and they start to realize that they want to be with each other and not with the other people um but of course they're going to have to work through either a little bit of a communication issue because they're both going to think that they want to be with the other person um but also clay has got um a lot of stuff going on in his um, private life with his family um that will also make things a little bit difficult for them so at this point i pretty much read all of the books on my tbr for the month of march with a bit of a gap to go because the only one i had left that i needed to read was the homewrecker by sarah kate and that wasn't out until the 28th of march and so i decided that i was going to pick up torment to mine by anna zares because torment to mine had been recommended to me on several occasions by Aisha857 who assured me it was the ultimate captor captive romance and I absolutely had to read it now even though it's in my TBR jar waiting for me to pick it out um she suggested that I didn't wait till then and that I absolutely picked this up and like I say because I had a little bit of a gap between reading the last one on my TBR and the home record coming out I thought I'm going to pick up a uh, torment of mine and um see what all the fuss is about and then after that i went down a bit of an anazares rabbit hole because the next five books that i read were all anazares so the first one then torment mine is um book one in a four-part romance i believe with the same couple and this is one of the reasons i hadn't read this series before because i generally don't like reading um you know books about the same sort of couple in the series because it's quite an investment isn't it once you start you uh, need to carry on reading so this is very much a dark romance it's a cat to cat situation it's a kidnapping and also a bit of a revenge plot and in this one we're following peter and sarah now peter is our russian hero he has had a very very difficult past lots of um blood and gore in his past but essentially he is a, a machine basically he's been trained um to be um one of the best sort of trackers assassins um in the world yeah he was brought up in like a sub siberian camp for young boys he had to learn how to survive how to fight how to defend himself from a very early age and when he finally got out he was picked up by the secret sort of um service in russia and then was trained to um be part of a anti-terrorist organization for russia and he specialized in tracking and torturing um terrorists to figure out um what they were doing now during his um you know during this time he ended up um meeting a woman um marrying her and having a baby um but they lived um in a completely separate sort of place to him and he would only visit between missions because he wanted to make sure they were safe however one day he gets a call to say that his wife and son are both um killed in fact they were killed in an attack by the american government um because they were thinking that the place where they were there was terrorists there and so they went in and unfortunately they were you know sort of gunned down and so peter is absolutely devastated distraught and filled with uh, anger and a need to get revenge on the people who did this and he figures out that there's a list there's a list of people um that are responsible for this attack and he's going to find every single one of them and take his revenge and this is where the book really starts because sarah is a doctor she's a gynecologist and she is married to who she thinks is a journalist 
Now, we know that they've had, they've been, she's been married for about 10 years to this um, supposed journalist, but what we find out is that his journalism is actually a cover story, uh, also an excuse why he has to do a lot of traveling, um, but really he works for the CIA, CIA as a bit of a spy. Now, he is one of the people on Peter's list. Now, 18 months before the start of this book, her husband is involved in a car accident and ends up basically as a vegetable but he is also being protected sort of by the FBI and they tell her it's because of a story that he was working on as a journalist but really it's because by this point the uh, the American government and the FBI and CIA everything know that Peter is going to inform these people on this list and so they put her husband up under protection even despite the fact that he's now on life support so this book starts sorry this is a big so this is a lot of setup for this book, but it starts where Peter goes to her house and threatens her and does some light torturing um, to try and get her to tell him where her husband is. Um, and eventually he injects her with some truth serum um, where she basically reveals the location of her husband and then Peter goes to take revenge. Of course, she's very traumatised by this. She gets questions by the FBI. She starts to figure out that maybe things aren't what they seem and her husband wasn't who she thought he was. Um, and she starts to then um, have kind of um, these nightmares. She becomes very, very paranoid that somebody is watching her. Of course, it's only actually paranoia if it's not true because in fact, Peter has taken to keeping his eye on her. And about six months after her husband um, is eliminated, um, Peter comes back into her life and pretty much takes over. So he literally comes into his into her house, um, pretty much starts to live with her, cook for her, make sure that she's followed at all times and that she has no choice about what's going on um, and she knows that she can't go to the authorities. However, the FBI figure out he's there and after a couple of weeks have gone by, he realises he cannot allow her to carry on with her job and everything like that. He needs to take her. And so he, at this point then, he kidnaps her, takes her captive and takes her to this remote location in Japan where he has this kind of safe house. Um, and so then Sarah is kept in captivity by Peter in the safe house um, for months. Um, and, you know, Peter is has become absolutely obsessed with her, wants to be with her, wants her to fall in love with him, wants um, him to become her everything. Um, and while Sarah is extremely attracted to him, they have amazing chemistry, um, great sex together, she cannot bring herself to give in and to fully hand herself over to him. And she's also, you know, struggling against the fact that she has been held captive by him as well. And so this is kind of the basis for their sort of relationship, but also their kind of struggle as well. So the first book, like I say in this series, Torment of Mine, this takes us all the way up to the point where he takes, where he kidnaps her and takes her to Japan. And then book two, Obsession Mine, uh, which I also went on to read is then while pretty much while she is in Japan working her way up to the point where she leaves there and then something else happens from there. Now I gave Torment of Mind four stars, I really enjoyed that and I was totally sucked into this world, was desperate to read the next book but the next book I only rated three and a half stars and one of the main reasons I did this was because I felt the book two became quite repetitive in nature. It was a constant battle of her trying to escape, wanting to escape, not wanting to be there. Then you'd have a scene with them together and she'd go, oh, I don't know why I want to leave. This is perfect. We're perfect for each other. I've got such great connection to him. And then, um, that, but then she would feel, feel lots of guilt and remorse for feeling that way. And then she'd pull back again and then she'd go into this, I'm not going to give in to him. And so it was a constant uh, repetition of giving in, not giving in, giving in, not giving in, and Peter being constantly, you know, frustrated and angry about the fact that she's not given herself fully to him and that she can never forgive him or forget kind of what's sort of happened. So I really kind of like the dark nature of this. I really like Peter's, you know, personality. Um, he's a sort of hero that I absolutely like. Um, and I think as the series goes on, I'll probably enjoy books three and four. But this 
uh, book two because it is you know a stretch it's a relationship that stretched over four books normally it would probably be the middle section of a book that you'd only be reading 20% of but it's now stretched over a whole book so for me like I said it, it was a little bit repetitive not as enjoyable as book one that said I really did want to go on to read books three and four to figure out what happened but as I read then on Amazon um, pick before I pick up book three and it says put a note on it to say before you read book three it's best enjoyed if you've read the twist me series so go on to read twist the twist me series so I thought um since I still have time that's what I'm going to do I'm going to jump into the twist me series and then go back to the tormentor series instead so then after that I read twist me keep me and hold me by Anne Zares, which is the twist me trilogy also following the same couple and in this one we're following uh, Julian and Nora now one of the reasons why Anna Zare said read this one first is because in this book um, we are following Julian Julian is mentioned until mine to mine series and in fact twist me series was written first so chronologically that's the order Anna Zare's wrote this one in so in this story we meet Peter we see Peter basically works for Julian and it's Julian that's promised Peter the list that he can go after and so I think one of the reasons that Anna Zare says read, the, read this one first is because it contains spoilers about what kind of what happens to Peter, why Julian is not happy with Peter, and then whatever's going to happen in book three or four of the Torment of Mind series, I think Julian is going to be involved. And therefore, if you hadn't read this trilogy before you read book three, then it would give away some spoilers from that trilogy. But essentially, Julian is a Colombian arms dealer. He is... Um, very very influential he's got loads of government agencies and bodies in his pocket he trades um not only to governments but to terrorists as well but he's very very choosy about who he does business with and he also is fiercely protective of his own identity and very few people know who he actually is or where he is now Nora is an absolutely regular person um she is uh, just about to finish high school she's just turning 18 and she goes out with her friend to sort of a club and she happens to bump into Julian at this club and Julian sees her and she looks like somebody that he knew very well in his past um, and as a result he becomes obsessed with her now when they first meet it's just an encounter in this club Nora senses that he's quite a dangerous man but doesn't really think too much of it and then leaves and then a couple of weeks later when she's actually at her high school graduation she notices that Julian's in the crowd and she thinks it's really odd but she passes it off and says that's a bit weird but he must be here for somebody else but in fact he's there for Nora and then he's not really going to do anything about his obsession too much until she goes on a date with a football player at her school um, and Julian can't stand it anymore and while she's out on the date with this guy he basically attacks her date and then takes her captive and he takes her captive and he flies her to this private island that he's got in the pacific where he basically uh, keeps her captive for 15 months now on this island it's a beautiful island lovely sort of setting um, and there's also another lady there called beth and beth is very very loyal to julian julian saved her life um, and she is there very, very much to caretake, look after, keep an eye on um, Nora. Um, so when Julian kind of has to leave to go off and do business before he comes back, she, Nora's got company, but someone kind of like taking care of her and stuff like that. So of course, Nora um, is very traumatised by the fact that she's been kidnapped by Julian. Very quickly, she realises that she has no choice. Julian is very dominant, very obsessed with her. Um, and he's actually also a dominant and a sadist sexually and he decides that he's going to train Nora to be his perfect submissive, his perfect partner um, and um, begins his training with her in earnest. So this is a dark uh, romance, lots of dark sort of non-con um, dubious consent scenes in this one um, as this relationship starts to develop but of course Nora absolutely responds to everything that Julian does to her she 
holds a little bit of guilt for that but a bit of surprise that this is you know she's secretly enjoying it and she does attempt to you know fight against this captivity um but ultimately starts to very much to succumb to julian to the island to this new way of life um and so she doesn't struggle quite as much as sarah does in torment of mine um she well she just uh, tried to fight it at first she eventually kind of relaxes into her new life and existence but as we go through the book obviously they're not going to be able to stay on the island forever there comes a point where they need to leave the island and um a point in time in fact where she even thinks julian is dead and she goes home and she tries to live a normal life for a few more months until julian comes back to get her once more uh, but they can no longer go back to the island and they end up in his um sort of family estate in Colombia, which is also heavily guarded and like i say this is where we meet peter peter's very much involved um he's in involved with a quite a big plot point in this trilogy as we go through um and uh, we start to see why julian P and peter no longer speak to each other so as a series i rated this series four stars um i did enjoy it uh, and like i say i kind of felt like i went down this anasaya's rabbit hole where i just kind of like felt totally consumed by these stories and wanted to keep reading of course that took me right up until the 28th of march so i haven't yet been able to go back to finish the torment of mind series off which i definitely will do as soon as i get the opportunity um but i really wanted to pick up the um the latest release from sarah kate that came out um just a few days ago and that's the home wrecker this one was a complete change of pace from Anna's Airs. It was a breath of fresh air um, and it was kind of nice to peek out of the, quite a dark space that I'd got myself in for, for, over, for over the last five books. Um, and this is a contemporary romance, it's MMF. Um, it sort of has a bi awakening in here as well um, and a marriage in trouble. So this is book two in the Good Brothers series and we are following Caleb who is the brother um, of Adam who is the hero from book one and we are also following Briar who is Caleb's wife and Dean who is going to be um, the uh, third person in their relationship. So again this one needs a little bit of a setup because like I say Caleb is Adam's brother, Caleb has a twin brother called Luke um, but they also have a younger brother called Isaac and when they were growing up they grew up in a very very religious household, um, their father was a preacher however we come to realise that he is um, not strictly religious, he's more doing it because he knows the um, position gives him a lot of power in the community, we start to realise that he is quite a corrupt um person and at the end of book one his uh his father is actually arrested and now faces um charges because he attempted to um assault sage who is adam's girlfriend but as they were growing up he was very sort of like hard demanding sort of father and their youngest uh, brother isaac um, was gay and when he was 17 he came out to his father his father ran him out of home and he's kind of like lived away from the family ever since they've not been in contact with him but he had a friend called Dean who was his sort of boyfriend um, and Dean therefore harbors a lot of resentment to this family overall and particularly Caleb because he very much thinks that it was Caleb's fault that his father found out that um, Isaac was gay um, and therefore his father Isaac has disappeared so Dean does not like Caleb at all. Now Caleb and Briar are married, they've been married about 10 years and they've already got one daughter but they have been trying desperately for a second child but nothing has worked. Um, and several years have passed now and they're almost sort of given up hope that they'll be able to conceive naturally um, and as a result their sex life has turned, taken a very much of a downturn because they only now have sex when they are trying to conceive a baby. You know when she gets the alert on her phone to say that she's ovulating that's when they have sex so it's taken all the spontane spontaneity out, all of the fun out of their sex life and so it, this is starting to become a bit of a marriage in trouble. So Dean meanwhile is a sex worker, he actually works at the same sex club that's owned by Sage and Adam that we saw in book one. Now Dean lives with his father who is terminally ill and one day his apartment sets on fire, 
his um and therefore after the fire brigade have been and everything it's um not habitable anymore and his father ends up going to live in a kind of assisted living kind of like a, a home where he can um, be properly looked after um and get sort of end of life care as well um and um adam and sage suggest that dean goes and lives with caleb and briar because they have an apartment above their garage um, and it's currently free um and so adam asks caleb if he'll put dean up now he's not sure about this at first because obviously he and dean don't really see eye to eye um but dean really needs somewhere to stay and so caleb says absolutely he can now it becomes very clear very quickly that both caleb and briar are very attracted to dean and dean is attracted to them um and dean starts very much flirting with briar caleb notices isn't too happy and kind of um confronts dean and said you know stop flirting with my wife i don't want you to be anywhere near her and dean sort of challenges him and says you know well i think um i can definitely turn her head i think um if i wanted to i could uh, win her over and caleb says absolutely you couldn't no way my wife is absolutely loyal to me and dean says well let's let's see what happens and so really dean then starts to press both briar and caleb's buttons um and it becomes apparent very quickly that Briar really does want to be with Dean. Um, but Caleb is also having feelings for Dean. And he needs to work through these as well because he has known for a while that he is bisexual. But he's very much suppressed those feelings. And after he married Briar, he thought um, he never would have to worry about that ever again. Or think about that or confront that or come to terms with that. That's who he was as a person. But Dean really starts to open Caleb's eyes, open Briar's eyes, um, and Dean really starts to help them as a couple with their marriage, but then they realise that they want Dean to be part of this relationship too, and they can't, you know, they can't go on unless they are all together. So I really, really like um, the way that this sort of plays out, um, how the characters all start to develop uh, relationships with each other as well as collectively i think sarah kate does a brilliant job of navigating these types of topics and subjects in a really really um careful and considered way and um yeah i thoroughly enjoyed it and rated this one four and a half stars so there we go this is going to be a really long video as always for my monthly wrap up but i hope you enjoyed it if you did please give it a thumbs up remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content from me and i just want to say thank you very much for watching and i'll see you next time bye <sighs> dean meanwhile is a he um was brought up in I believe but like I said this is part of a trilogy so what I will say is oh, quite a lot of things should I just leave it there we're just left knowing not quite a lot of things we just don't know them we just don't know what they are